put that in my pocket. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak today uh, on very short notice. Uh, extremely pleased to be able to do so. Um, so just in watching the presentations this morning, um, actually I see two agendas that are being simultaneously discussed, in fact, many, but broadly speaking, I can see two different sets of things being discussed. One is, we know that brains can solve real world problems that computers can't yet solve, speech recognition and, and so on, uh, incomplete data, ambiguous inputs. What algorithms and software architectures can we design to match human performance on those tasks? And then another set of things that seem to be related to power consumption, we've got these massive servers, you know, gigantic uh, high performance computing uh, uh, systems using 30 megawatts to do 17.6 petaflops and there's something that uh, we apparently can learn from the brain about power consumption and efficiency. Is there some way to get that kind of compute performance without having to have the 30 megawatt, you know, the, the nuclear power station nearby to, to supply it? Um, and I believe that I can at least I have opinions about both of those based on the experiences that I've had over the last 12 years in running a company, uh, not, not right, founding a company, uh, whose goal was to reverse engineer the human hearing system, commercialize that with dedicated chip products. So uh, I'm going to do two minutes just of introduction so you know who, who I am and why it is that I would be wanting to talk about something like this. So uh, I was a Carver Mead student at Caltech. I was there at the same time as Christoph Koch. Um, uh, I was working on cochlea modeling, but the idea was in 2000 that we might be able to understand the neurobiology of hearing and enough about the brain that uh, we could contemplate forming a company to commercialize that. We expected that it would be dedicated hardware, so it was going to be a chip company. However, by that time, I did not expect it to be an analog VLSI company. Uh, but I had already been employed at Synaptics and Arithmos and bent my sword on analog VLSI. And I was digital all the way from that point on. Um, so uh, commercialized with ded dedicated chip products. These two figures show the, the conceptual idea. Here's the auditory pathway in the brain. We've known since the 1950s or so from Golgi staining and everything that uh, this is the pathway that signals take from the cochlea up to the auditory cortex. And even in the year 2000 when I founded the company, this was kind of the view of the auditory pathway. This is as much as I could get the neuroscientists I was collaborating with to say about what was going on. Everything that was happening in cortex had to do with speech and so on. I couldn't get convincing consensus answers. Everyone had opinions, but there was no consensus. Um, what I was able to do at the time was look at the overall function of, of the brain. Speech recognition is something that's happening up in the top, modeled crudely here by the, the contents of a normal speech recognizer. But before you get to the recognizer, there's this huge job being done down below, spanning the auditory brainstem and, and thalamus and uh, inferior colliculus, that's helping you pull the sound you want out of the noisy mix. The scene analysis or the scene understanding that uh, one of the speakers discussed earlier this morning, before you recognize the interesting thing, you've got to pull it out of the, of the noise. So this was the stream separation function. Uh, that little block, the green block there, became the concept for our first product. We would take two microphones, put them through a cochlea transform, pull out the sound of your voice, uh, and in fact, it's a reasonable chance that 70% of the people in the room have one of my company's chips in your pocket. You don't even know it. We're in some very popular phones. Um, and uh, we make two mic noise suppression for popular cell phones. So the idea was put, you're already used to having a microphone at the bottom of, of the phone, what you normally talk to, put one at the top. Now you have a two ear system, much like the human auditory pathway or any animal with, you know, with two ears. We built the chip that's the brain for the auditory part that can tell that you're talking close to this microphone and your voice is far away from that one. Noise is coming from far away, come in with equal amplitude. Your voice has an advantage at this mic compared to that one. And so we can do se separation based on the spatial position of the sound source, identifying your voice, putting it across the channel, and sending it clean without all the background noise. So this became our product, a chip that does just that part of the auditory pathway, the bottom bit there, bottom 10%. It goes there between the microphones and the baseband processor chip, typically made by Qualcomm, for example. So we go in between, and uh, we sell it for a dollar, and we've 
sold nearly half a billion of them now. The uh, company uh, offered it first in 2007. It became a hit in 2010 when it was designed into a very popular phone, and which we don't talk too much about, but it's in the phone. Um, and uh, we did an IPO last year. Okay, so that's the background. So from the beginning, the company has been about reverse engineering the human hearing system and building hardware to do it. Okay, so the other point I want to make here is a, Timing is everything. When you start your company really matters. Since there's been lots of talk in the last few years about we can now build a mouse brain, we can do 10 to the 11th ops, you know, there's different groups that are importantly registering that milestone. The first time I saw anything like that was in Ray Kurzweil's book in 1999, Age of Spiritual Machines, where he was projecting Moore's Law and saying, in calibrating the axes, saying in 2000 we would have about 10 to the 8th or 10, 10 to the 9th ops per second, and that was about the compute capacity of an insect, a dragonfly. By 2010, we'd have a mouse. And by 2025 or 29, we'd have a human. OK, and so the computing was going to be there. When I looked at that plot, I was very inspired. That's a roadmap for what I want to do. And I'm at the right age to build a company. I could start, with, start that. But I did not perceive that. I, yes? There's one problem with it. We're now in 2013, and we have to be done in a world. Yeah, so, yes. so let, let, me, let me say where I'm at with the company, because uh, that was not my agenda. What, in fact, when I looked at this, I thought, this is just a way of calibrating the axes, so people know what, what the axes mean, what 10 to the 11 ops means. When I looked at that, I thought, the research agenda that I would follow is this. In 2000, build one neural module, and for the hearing system, the neural module that you begin with is the cochlea. It's the well, most well understood one. You can begin there understand it, build it at high resolution, and work your way in. And by 2010, you have a chance of understanding one major pathway. We're not all the way done, but we've got a lot of it done, enough that we could build a profitable company. In the end, this is how it worked out. Founded the company, I believe, at the right time, in 2000. By the time we were ready to ship a product, it was 2010, and we actually could do enough of the pathway, we could build a business. OK, so that's the idea. It depended on neuroscience knowledge advancing in tandem with computing technology. If one got ahead of the other, we'd be, you know, we'd be starved on the other. And it's turned out that they've advanced very synergistically. We couldn't really talk about what was happening in the audit beyond the auditory cortex uh, in 2000. I tried to get my neuroscience advisors to, to tell me what they thought was happening, and they couldn't get it. But 2007, Hickok and Popple wrote a nice summary of the speech areas in the brain. And that appears to have some consensus support for what speech, how speech is processed in the cortical regions. Christine and Garot wrote in 2004 another study on a related area on how do we recognize who is speaking. All of this is part of the human auditory pathway. And so my goal was to understand this and reduce it to some kind of engineering practice where I could build a functioning, real-time, high-resolution model using whatever technology was available today. That is the block diagram that is now my working, my working model. Just going to grab my water here. So I'm not going to walk you through all the details of it. There is a publication that, that describes this. Um, but the reason I'm putting it up there is to give you an idea of the complexity. When you, when you look at an entire brain region from sensor, the bottom, the cochlea, and the, you know, the outer ear and middle ear, all the way up to the highest level functions, speech recognition, music perception, um, uh, speaker identification, and also lower level systems uh, like the emotional responses to sound. This is my attempt to deal with the complexity of the entire auditory pathway system as a subset of the entire brain and not get caught in what the low level is doing or only what the cortex is doing. Right? So it tries to be comprehensive. And the idea was build a working model of everything that there was a neuroscientist who could tell me what was going on there. Right? Not try and make up models, but build something. This is where I have working models that have some degree of support from a functioning neuroscientist who says, that's what I see. I'm going to show you a very quick demo. Normally, I would give a real-time demo. But everything runs in real time on a notebook computer. Um, but I'm going to show you a movie of, well, normally what I do is show one representation at a time, show you the cochlea, show you the multipolar cells, spherical bushy cells, and so on. Every one of these is a separate demo. In early 2000, all we could do was 
one demo at a time. Moore's law, thankfully, has kept on going. And now in 2012, we can run all of them simultaneously. That's the beginning of a parallel brain architecture that really contemplates parallel computing of all of the things such that they can be aggregated. That's the ante into the big game. And very few people ante up, right? In order to play the ante where you have all the representations, you have to build every single one of them and bring them in. That is such an expensive thing. It's taken me 12 years to be able to do it. Not too many people can, can stay in the game that long. Most you know, graduate students come and go, right? To stay on it for 12 years and keep it funded is, in fact, non-trivial. But anyway, I'm going to show you a movie instead of one at a time. I'm going to show you the movie of all of them running. It's a screen grab from a video, uh, you know, from, from a running demo. But here's what it looks like. Oh, yeah. And let's see. I don't have enough hands, and we don't have audio plugged in. So for the moment, it's going to be a sort of visual demo. It, 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 you'll see in a minute. January 10th. Okay, so since there's not enough time, I won't take you through every single thing, but the idea is we're computing the cochlea. This is what this scrolling spectral energy looks like. This is the ILD and ITD representations that tell you where sound is coming from. We compute those in the lower part of the brainstem. This is a corellogram. This is a pitch-oriented corellogram on a spiral. This is a formant tracker. This is showing you about tongue position of the determined uh, portion of the speech as it's represented in the lower uh, auditory cortex. This is polyphonic pitch separation, and this is a rudimentary speech recognizer that has the basic components. There, it's a placeholder for what cortex would be doing in that area. The idea was to fit with not just the usual Kepstrom uh, front end to a speech recognizer, but with something that was informed by all the things that the brain computes on the way up to the higher, higher levels. A true model from the ground up. That was the idea. And so far, Moore's Law has kept on giving us machines that allowed us to just barely do as much as we knew what to do. We never ran out of compute power yet, and we've always just barely had good input. You know, the, the neuroscientists and the computers have stayed in lock sync with each other. Neither one's ever gotten ahead. Okay, so now how am I doing? We got about halfway through the talk? Good, perfect, okay. So there were, there were two questions at the beginning of the talk. There's how do we look at what the brain is doing and use that to help us inform software architectures to do things that so far chip, um, computers have not been able to do? And then there's the hardware question, how can we get something approaching the phenomenal efficiency, power efficiency? So for the, the brain-like software architectures, well, first of all, I, I don't have any deep theory behind it. I'm, I placed a bet 12 years ago, actually, in 1988, 20, 24 years ago, that reverse engineering the brain would lead to something good, something commercializable, and hopefully where we, we are now as a, as a group in this uh, DARPA study is, you know, is there something about the architectures of the brain that can guide us in building better types of computers? So here, the, the bet began with brains use high resolution representations of the world computed in real time with low latency. That's really important. It, it's at least important for the survival in the real world. The giant servers that are analyzing weather data or terrorism spots or you know, whatever, that it's a different class of problem. But for the survival in the real world, which I believe is of DARPA interest, uh, robotics, for example, that can autonomously navigate and so on, computed in real time with low latency is extremely important. And you, you don't get that for free. You have to really work at it. Um, the next thing is, from an architecture point of view, the conventional signal processing view of since the 1980s has been you start with a rich signal and the brain is progressively refining it into a simpler and simpler thing. So for example, speech comes in uh, and by the time you're done with it, out pops a message that carries about 50 bits per second that is the, what the spoken words are. And this is what the brain's job is to do is to s reduce the amount of information flow. Well, when I try to build the, the things that you just saw the demos of, this is not what I see the brain doing. The brain does something that's a lot more like this picture. First of all, you don't start with just one signal. You start with a bunch of signals. Before you even get to the one you want, you've got to tear it apart from the other distracting signals. So you've got unwanted other signals. 
In order to get the one you want, you may be listening for the speech content, but in the process, you're also getting my identity, the pitch of my voice, uh, the location as I move around, and so on. You, you're extracting all that information to help you get the speech out that you want. So this is a better picture. Perfect distractors in the background. It's not stopping you from understanding what I said at all. That's because there's the unwanted other signal right on cue, um, which you had no trouble pulling out and still extracting the message they want. This is a much better visualization of what the brain is doing. And when you look at the neuro, uh, the, the, the neural architectures that are underneath it, you see large numbers of parallel things, then aggregated with multiple hypotheses to, about choosing the best one, and then another set of recognizing and multiple hypotheses. Okay. Next thing, just at the highest level on the neuroscience representations. One of the talk speakers this morning mentioned what data representation should we use? And I know it's been a huge debate since the 1980s. Do we need to use spikes? Can we get away without using spikes? And so on. In 1992, I wrote a spiking neuron simulator using an event-driven technology. I believe still it's, it's the fastest way. If you want to do spikes, it's the fastest way to simulate networks of spiking neurons. And I was prepared to use that in 1990, or 2000, at the beginning of my forming of my company. I went to my neuroscience advisors, Donata Ertel, uh, Eric, uh, sorry, uh, Tom Yin, Christoph Schreiner, and so on, and especially Donata down at the bottom said, don't use spikes. You can convert to spikes, you can convert back out from spikes, but with the exception of the octopus cell is one thing where you can use other representations, get the algorithm right. And we can tell you what the algorithm is without the distraction of a spike representation and coming back out. So for better or for worse, I took that advice. I know there will be dispute about that and controversy, but nonetheless, I took that advice and focused on the algorithms. And that has allowed me to move more quickly than if I had been focused just on the, um, on the spiking representation. And the key point at the software, software architecture level, there may be some debate about this as well. Um, but I recently had this debate with Ray Kurzweil before Ray's book was written, or when it was written, but he asked me to take a look at it and he wanted to use my figures, uh, in particular, oops, where's my other, sorry, this figure. This figure appears in the book. It's the hierarchical summary of the overall auditory pathway. He wanted to be able to show that there was biological connection to what he was saying. But I was really hoping that he would use that figure. I wanted him to use both. Here's the real guts. This is just a hierarchical summary of the regions that the neuroscientists are telling me are present. He ended up not using the detailed figure. He just ended up using the summary. And it, I know from the debate that I had with him, there were two points that I was trying to make. One is, um, it's not just one master algorithm that is present everywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Christoph in advance since the quote was given earlier today in the, one of the other talks, but I argued with Ray that every one of these regions that I have up there has something very different going on in it. The best example I was able to find was the FOXP2 gene. If you knock out two base pairs in this one gene, you don't get a fully functioning speech recognition capability. You end up with effectively speech recognition capability of a chimpanzee. And it's not just the brain that is affected, it's also motor production, upper lip movement, and so on. To me, that was a convincing argument of cortical specificity. It's not one master algorithm, it's special algorithms at each of these blocks, even though it's in cortex, something special is going on there. Okay, finally, let me just check time. I have 10 minutes? Good, okay, it's all on time. So, Ray and I had that debate about cortical specificity, and in the end, he chose to just show this picture and make a, a, a simpler point about a single algorithm that could run everywhere. But in fact, my, what I see when I talk to the neuroscientists is something very special. You know, stream separation is going on in here. Pitch extraction is being done here. Feature detection for speech recognition like phonemes, the phoneme part of a recognizer is happening here. Com lexical network from Hickok and Popple is happening here. Each one of these regions is doing something totally different than the other regions. Okay, so cortical specificity. The other debate that Ray and I had 
was about the importance of non-cortical areas. The brain isn't just the cortex. And in particular, I argued with him, if you don't have a thalamus, you don't have a brain. You know, the thalamus is the giant crossbar switch that connects all the brain elements together. Without that, uh, there's, you don't have a brain. So I thought that it was important not to oversimplify. OK. Um, the last point on the software architectures, uh, so neuroscience has been keeping up with computing capability so far. So clearly, nobody is saying that Moore's Law is going to run out now or this year. It's something we expect, we're worried about for 10 years. In fact, we've always been worried about it 10 years out since the beginning of time. And somehow, we, every, everyone who's predicted the death of Moore's Law has been wrong so far, right? Um, there's, we always find some way around it. The, the death of Moore's Law is hinging on some assumption that can be, in fact, worked around. It's the oxide thickness, OK, well, you can get around that with something else. Oh, well, you use parallelism when you run into the limit of clock rate and size of the chip and so on. OK, here's what I found, though. Paul Allen advised me, he, Paul, when I was working at Interval, he said, don't get too hung up on the, the hardware yet. At that time, it was way too early. I didn't have any of this stuff working yet. He said, focus on the algorithms. Don't worry about trying to build the chips yet. Get the algorithms to work, and then implement them in the technology of the day. And so far, the technology of the day has kept on supporting. Um, now I've got a core i7 with enough cores to be able to do this in real time. And just when I'm, I'm now facing into it, but now I can compute all these representations, but I can't yet aggregate them together. I'm, now I'm out of MIPS, right? Ah, along comes the Xeon Phi. 60 Intel cores in one box you can put in a slot. So suddenly, oops, I've got 60 times as much right when I need it. Intel is there. So you wouldn't expect, I wasn't expecting to be a cheering section there, but they keep on coming through. I haven't yet had to go over to a GPU. I contemplated it. But in fact, mapping my, the, the software that I've written into the structure that could be read, you know, dealt with as a shader, that was an obstacle for me. But 60. Intel cores in one box, oh, I can use that. Okay, so, so far, Intel keeps on making it possible for me to get my work done. Okay, so that's what I have to say about software architectures. I'm not running out of MIPS anytime soon for the simulations that I'm doing. But now when it comes to hardware, what it, you wanna ship a product. All I've talked about now is simulations of the conceptual system, which is what Paul recommended that I do, get the algorithms right. I'm still working on the algorithms. It's a 25-year project, 13 more to go. But on the hardware, what about the, the limits of Moore's Law? I worked at Synaptics in 1991 when it was all analog VLSI. It was going to be wafer scale, analog VLSI with floating gate memories for super low power. It was a beautiful vision. There was nothing wrong with that vision but doing that kind of computing. But it did not turn out to be the paradigm changer that we expected it to be at that time. We all joined that company because we wanted it to succeed. But in the end, digital computing was still the reminding paradigm. They became the touchpad company that does it all digitally. Audience builds our noise suppression chip, and it's a totally digital chip except for the A to Ds and D to As on the output that allow us to look like a microphone to the baseband processor. It's the only reason that we do any analog at all is because it's necessary to get the signals in and out. Right? So I have not personally found it necessary to make the jump into analog. But what I do want to talk about is the, the fundamental reason why we were driven towards analog was the promise of super low power. Carver in the early days put low power consumption as the primary goal. It should have microwatts of power, and we could achieve that with subthreshold analog. However, now that we make chips for cell phones, we also have a low power constraint. Our customers scream if it's more than 30 milliwatts and threaten to design us out and chuck off our revenue and all kinds of stuff. So it's got to be low power. But it's got to be low enough. It's got to be low enough power, but it also shouldn't be too big. Uh, shouldn't be too expensive. And it turns out, commercially, the trade-off point, the, the, the crossover point between power consumption and cost and area or volume, the physical size of the device, that's what drives you towards a thing that has 100 megahertz and does lots of, you know, a single processor doing lots of things as opposed to many parallel processors all dedicated, that would be a much bigger chip. I'm going to give you an example because it's one that we, we had to deal with or we contemplated. 
A typical cell phone noise reduction chip, not any particular companies, but typical-ish, would be 20 milliwatts of power with about 100 megahertz clock, about a very small chip, two millimeters squared, costing about a dollar. Okay? That's sort of the typical parameters of how, that, you know, how we succeed in that kind of business. But it, it's not that we don't know how to build a chip that's less power, consumes less power. Right? The hearing aid guys are doing almost the exact same thing, but they're balancing where to be on the power consumption and volume and cost curve in a, just a totally different place. We could live there too, but the customers don't want us to. Their, the hearing aid approach is power consumption really matters, half a milliwatt to do the exact same job as we do in 20 milliwatts. And how do they get that low power consumption? They have data, data converters. They just have a ton of resistors, just big chip area. They throw a huge chip area at it, and it's very low power. We do switching things that are far tinier, but they can consume more power, and we can afford to do it for our application. Not only that, but by the time they have all these uh, parallel elements, they end up with something that's like 20 square millimeters, not four square millimeters, and the chip costs $10. We, we wouldn't be in business if we, if we went to our customers and said, how about a $10 chip for half a milliwatt? They'd say, are you crazy? No. So it's not that we don't know how to build low power digital systems. It's that it's not the right balance of cost and physical space in ever decreasing size devices. So now with that, all of these experiences that I've had of trying to build super low power things at Synaptics and Arithmos, of wanting to build super low power things for, you know, at audience that could fit into a tiny power footprint. The trade-offs suggest there's another whole different type of solution. Instead of a two gigahertz thing that does what you want, but at power that's more than you want, there is another solution over there that doesn't require you to abandon digital technology at all and keep all the benefits of reliability and everything else. Here is my modest proposal for DARPA, if you should be so interested to pursue it. Imagine a one kilogram, three-dimensional block of silicon, right, composed of stacks upon stacks of super low power digital chips running with a 10 kilohertz clock rate and connections, you know, allowing them to all talk to each other. It's gonna be a block, like a sphere, because now, now the total transit time is not the dimensions of the chip in one picosecond, it's now in, in, a, in a few milliseconds can you get across this thing. The problem still, you know, it's assume a spherical chicken, you know, assume a spherical thing. It's, right, so anyway, you, you get the idea. This solution would be ridiculous, except that it has the potential to be so much lower power, that, you know, the 30 megawatts of power that includes how much of that megawatts of power is the air conditioning to cool off the thing that's cons you know, consuming half and you're paying twice for that power and so on. So it's a totally different kind of solution. I know that there are, people are being creative about different technologies. Could we swap out conventional digital technology, replace it with something with quantum, replace it with something analog? All of those are possible and I'm not arguing against them. What I'm saying is there are, I believe that there are something like six orders of magnitude to be had staying in digital, but just driving to an 85 millivolt power supply and having very slow, slow digital operations. Uh, but when you've got them that slow, then you have to have so many of them. It's just a whole different optimization point in the space. That would be my modest proposal to get super low power, still supporting the kind of uh, compute capabilities that we would like it to have. How are we doing on time? Right on? Okay. Take questions if there are any. Yes. How much uh, high levels of uh, core field are we causing that uh, that can be thought of as core field? Are you doing on your on your eighty ten ten chip right now? Very different. No. No. So let me just. Uh, deflect or at least uh, try, try to explain. I wasn't trying to make the point that we were doing that. This, this picture here, we've, I built the company to try and do all of this, and that's still my dream. But in the end, we were able to commercialize on our A1010 chip 
basically the ILD, interaural level and interaural, interaural temporal difference done in the, in the brain stem. Let me do Just keep the, the, the temporal pathway, the auditory pathway, that you go on your, on your chip. The interdifferent, the yeah. interdifferent. Yeah, right. It's it's literally this this little block diagram. Oops, is is all we ship. And then here, where we have a feature grouping in the stream, it's the placeholder for the the grouper, which would be a truly cortical process. We don't have to do anything nearly that sophisticated. We effectively we were able to build a multi hundred million dollar business because we were able to come up with the amazingly simple party trick that when you hold the phone like this. You're close to one mic and not at the other. So we didn't have to build a cortex to build a functioning commercial product. That's why. So Christoph's question is exactly right. We, we have not yet had to build a cortex. What I tell my investors is uh, the bottom 10% of the auditory pathway was a well, 300 million market cap idea. Just imagine what the, rest of the, the other 90% is worth. And we're, we're still trying to pursue that. Yes? Um, is there any other questions? Yes. Uh, actually, a couple of comments. Uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, uh, that you'd come down at the same place uh, these days on the question of spiking uh, as you as you as you came up with uh, ten years ago. I think the the evidence of getting more out of the system with spiking continues to accumulate. The second point, though, that I would make is that uh, the fact that you have uh, cortical systems that are specialized for different functions doesn't mean that the hardware is any different. It just means that that particular piece, the, the set of connections that define the function of that particular piece have been trained in a different way. But the hardware doesn't have to be different to achieve that different function. I understood. I agree with that. In fact, I, uh, when I thought of that, the, the, way, the way that I think of it is Ray had the Vernon Mountcastle observation that also Jeff Hawkins made that, that it, you know, many micro columns that all look about the same. And yet, Fox P2 seems to suggest, suggest perhaps different software is loaded into each one of those things. So, uh, so I agree with your point, and that is consistent with what I was trying to say. Yep. Okay. Uh, I got to get out of your way now, Christoph. Oh, sorry. Um, here we go. Here we go, and it's in my pockets. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, for our uh, keynote speech, I'd like to introduce Christoph Koch, who's the uh, um, chief scientific officer for Allen Super Brain Science, uh, uh, professor at uh, Caltech. All right. Thank you much. I'll be a professor for another one month, and after 27 years, I'll be leaving Caltech, uh, just like Lloyd did, to join uh, to be full time at the um, at the Allen Institute. So there are three things that connect me with the previous uh, beautiful talk by um, Lloyd Watts. One is just like he was at Interval, I'm now an employee, as I mentioned already, by, uh, of another institution that's uh, funded by, um, by, uh, by Mr. Paul Allen, the Allen Institute for Brain Science, which is, which is 10 years old, which was started um, in 2003. It's a non-for-profit. We're situated in, um, 
in uh, Seattle and our mission is to fuel neuroscience. So it's all basic research, it's no IP or anything like that. It's to help understand the hardware. Um, again, the, the comment that Paul Allen made to Lloyds um, 15 years ago that he should focus at, at the level of, at the algorithmic level, I think was a very wise one because we still do not understand uh, really the brain. To paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill, it's best to say we are at the end of the beginning of our understanding of the, um, of the brain. Unlike uh, something else that connects me with the previous speaker, Ray Kurzweil, I just wrote a review of uh, his book, uh, How to Construct a Mind in Science, came out last week. Um, um, as Lloyd also mentioned, the idea that there's a single algorithm that explains all of biology and all of biological circuit, I think is complete bosh. Um, furthermore, we, we, the, the idea that in 10 years we'll be able to understand and fully simulate uh, the brain, I think is also complete nonsense. Fact of the matter is it's a little acknowledged dirty secret of neuroscience. We don't understand one of our simplest model system. One of our simplest model system is the worm, the round worm C. elegans which has exactly 302 neurons, they're hermaphrodite, uh, and it has 7,000 synapses, 967 cells, the entire organism. This, uh, this guy doesn't spike, so it's, in some sense it's ideal to build it in hardware because uh, you don't have to worry about spike representation because there's none. We have no idea how this little creature works. There's no general model for this simple creature. So the idea that, that someone in 10 years will understand it all just strikes me as, uh, well, um, a fond hope. Um, yeah, so so um, um, our mission is to understand is to understand the brain. It's not to build any special purpose hardware. So I'm not, uh, and I, I'm afraid I can't tell you too much about hardware. Having give that, I, I used to work with Carver Mead and build neuromorphic engineering, but for a number of reason I felt uh, building uh, the visual system. We were building retinas at the time. Would uh, while possibly interesting exercise for commercial or uh, intellectual reasons really doesn't help us understand. Um, to better understand the brain. <clears throat> so the Allen Institute, when I joined a year and a half ago, we're 155, we're now expanding under the, under the plan that we now have all the way up to 500 people, all uh, focused on essentially two projects. Um, we're not really a traditional PI-driven research institution, so in a couple of years we'll be 500 people, a neuroscientists essentially, physicists, computer scientists, but all focused on trying to understand cortex. Again, as Lloyd Watts mentioned, while we have a beginning of an understanding of the algorithms that work, that power um, the retina, that power the cochlea, we don't really understand cortex. We do not understand cortex even in, in outlines. So we felt it was essential to, uh, to start a very large project, all focused on trying to understand um, the brain. What, what makes this project unique and what makes it different from now other large-scale uh, projects such as the... Um, the, uh, the Human Brain Atlas, that I'm sure we'll hear tomorrow about the European project that Carl uh, Heinz um, Meyer will talk to us tomorrow about, or the recently announced Brain Activity Map, is that we are focusing a whole bunch of resources um, on and a couple of hundred scientists all on, uh, on a single model system, namely the mouse visual system and the neocortex in, uh, in, in human, the human neocortex. Uh, all working tightly together, so it's, very, it's, much more, it's much closer to a biotech matrix model. Um, all right, so um, a year and a half ago, the CEO, um, Alan Jones, and I made a proposal to Paul Allen. To f uh, the, we felt the time was now ready to start such a large-scale project uh, focused on, uh, on, um, on a model system, the neocortex. Um, and um, he accepted it. He gave, it's a 10-year project, and for the first three and a half years, he gave us $300 million. And we, uh, we also just ran, um, he also just gave us a, a building, so he's been extraordinarily generous. Um, the idea is what we're trying to do is something that physics and particular um, collider, elementary particle physics and astronomers have done since the last 60 years, ever since instrument became very expensive. This is a so-called CMT, it's, going to, it's built by Caltech, a team of, headed by Caltech in Berkeley. It's a ground-based telescope, it's going to sit on Mount Kea, that's going to have an effective aperture of 30 meters, vastly bigger than anything existing, consisting out of roughly 500 adjustable hacks hexagonal mirrors that are vibrated, these tons of steel are vibrated at up to 100 hertz. I mean, it's a pretty awesome structure. A thing like this requires a decade's worth of effort of planning, requires uh, probably in the full analysis a thousand people who are fully dedicated from it, from computer scientists, engineers, optical engineers to the astronomer, and cost a lot of money. 
And we want to do something similar, and, and, and we are all used to, as a society, we're used to the fact that we, build, that we need large colliders like the LHC in, um, in Geneva, Switzerland, and we're used to the fact that we need to, build, uh, we need to invest heavily in uh, astronomy to build observatories to look out at the origin of space and time and our place in the universe. Um, we're less used to the idea that we, we need to build equally large and powerful, well, maybe not equally large in terms of size, but in terms of instrumentation, sophistication, we need to build equally sophisticated instruments that peer at the mind that then can peer out and wander. So in order to do that, we need to have tools and methods that are standardizable, which doesn't exist at all in biology, uh, certainly not in systems neuroscience or uh, the field I'm representing. They need to be highly reproducible, not very good right now in neuroscience. They need to be very accurate and they need to be scalable to a large uh, high throughput pipeline. Um, this is a mission, so this project is called My, uh, MindScope. This is our mission. So we, we don't want to understand, I mean, understanding the brain, unlike uh, two other big projects, one being the Manhattan Project, where the goal was very simple. The goal was simply to get a big bang. The goal for, the, uh, for another large-scale science project, the human genome, was also relatively uh, simple. You wanted to sequence the human genome at, at 10 or uh, 30 times coverage. So it was relatively easy to know when, you, when you've achieved your goals. Understanding the brain is, of course, much more difficult than... Uh, even, you know, people have having debates and conferences now about what does it mean to understand the brain? Does it mean you can fix it? Does it mean you understand every, the function of every single gene? Does it mean you understand the function of every single neuron or synapse? Does it mean you can cure every possible disease? Does it mean you can simulate it? Those are all different possible answers to the question, what does it mean to understand the brain? What do we mean? We want to understand the computations, the, or Put differently, we want to understand the series of biophysical transformation that occur from the signals from the moment they reach the, the, the photoreceptor, the first layer in the nervous system proper, to, until, they really, um, until they lead to a percept that I can actually see. I don't see bits, right? I don't see pixels, I actually see people. Right? I see people and I see it within 300 milliseconds, the shape, the colors, etc. Same thing in, in mouse, very similar. And we'd like to understand what are the computations that lead to this at a very short time scale? So we're not dealing with uh, memory here. We're dealing with time scales on the order of a second or two, a couple of action perception cycle. I open my eyes and I see something and I can make a meaningful decision um, um, and act on that based on visual information. So that requires that we get the uh, connectome. The, so the, uh, uh, by connectome, we mean the, the cell-specific connectivity among all the neurons. Uh, that's a big exercise. It was only recently, real, well, it was realized 200 years ago that all bodies consist out of cells, right? All bodies, all biological organisms consist out of one or more cells. Then it was realized 120 years ago, well, there are probably two types of cells, excitatory cells and inhibitory cells. But then, of course, due to the genius of uh, Raymond and Cajal and much more recent, the last 150 years, or particularly the last 20 years, we realized there are not only two types of cells in the brain, they're probably on the order of a thousand different cell types inside the brain. So we're just talking about a structure like the cerebral cortex. In any one area, there might be 50, 60, 100 different cell types. So think about that Lego box set that many of you, certainly I grew up. Now imagine you have a, you have a Lego box that have, roughly has 86 billion parts. That's the, that's the number of cells in four male Brazilian uh, brains. Now imagine you have 86 billion Lego blocks. There are 1,000 different cell types, but only certain blocks fit onto the other. So only the 2 by 4 red fit onto the you know, 3 by 6 roof tiles, and they don't fit on other tiles. And those are the rules that we have to figure out. Every time we look, just like in astronomy, every time we look outside, we find the universe is a bigger place than, we, than the previous generation of, of astronomers thought. Every time we look in the brain, we see more and more untold complexity. So now we realize that we need to know. For instance, if you take a typical layer 5 thin tufted pyramidal cell, and depending on whether it sends its axon over to the other side of the corpus, corpus callosum, or whether it sends them down to the, inferior, uh, to the superior colliculus, it has, turns out it has a different cell type. There are different molecular promoters, and very likely it probably subserves a different function. And so we, we, we need to understand it at, the, at, at this level of complexity. Certainly, if we want to have any hope of curing um, diseases. So I'm not addressing here the point, if, uh, what complexity, what representation do we need if we wanted to build hardware to do practical things out in the world. I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned with trying to understand the brain from a, um, from a theoretical point of view and trying to understand diseases that affect all of us or will affect all of us like Alzheimer's, Parkinson, autism. Because we know already, the little that we do know about these diseases that they affect very particular parts. It's all about specificity. This is the great moral of 20th century biology. It's all about vast untold specificity. 
So that's one of the, so I'm not going to talk about the human uh, work today, I'll talk about the mouse work, that's the creatures we study. They're all um, exactly the same age, P56, after, so they're young adults, they're all males, and they're all exactly the same strain, which is very important. Labs use different strains of animals, and typically different strains of animals are quite different, and you find very different results. So the, the division is that we're going to concentrate enormous in-house resources on to trying to understand the most complex piece of uh, excitable matter, at least in the known universe. Um, so we'd like to understand something about the canonical computation performed by neocortex. Is there canonical computation? How does it differ, let's say, across the ten visual areas or between visual areas and auditory areas and between sensory areas and prefrontal areas? We, for that, we really need uh, synergy. We need to be able, it's critical that, the, for example, the, in sl the slice work works exactly on the same material as the in vivo, the, wo the, the work in the living animal, has to be exactly the same age the same gender, the same strain. You, you have to use the same coordinate system so you, that you can locate things within 10 or 20 micrometer. You have to have the same tools. You have to have the same analysis and the same data processing system, which all of means it can't really be done in the university. So some of our objectives is we like to characterize this connectome at the cell type specific level. So there are different definitions of connectome. One you might be familiar with. It's uh, out in the, in the New York Times these days. It's um, the crude connectome or the macro connectome at the functional brain imaging level that people want to do in humans where you want to map using DTI, diffusion tensor imaging is one particular type of brain imaging method where you want to map uh, very large connections in the human brain. So that you do with a voxel is maybe two by two by two millimeter. At the low end is ultimately ground truth of biology is uh, at the nanometer that's a micro uh, connectome uh, using um, electron microscopy, which is uh, something, a technique we're also doing. The level we are aiming is at the cell, uh, at the cell type level. So of those, let's say, 100 different cell, uh, cell types in any one area, like primary visual cortex, we, we like to have a complete 100 by 100 connectivity matrix that tells us cell type 55, let's see, in uh, Pavalmoon expressing interneuron in layer 4, what's its probability to connect with other PV cells or with other um, excite or with, let's say, with a spidey stellar cell as a function of distance, what's the probability distribution, does it adapt or not, things like that. <clears throat> then we're building these observatories to observe in vivo while the mouse sleeps, while the mouse runs, while the mouse makes decisions. I'll show you some. We can examine the brain and record it at high scale. Um, and then, um, of course, we'd like to simulate it in, in, um, in great detail. All that structural data we get from, from, from structural neuroanatomy and from other techniques to, uh, to use computer models to see the, how accurate can we replicate the observed physiology. And to make all of that thing, that's been our trademark. So we, we've built large atlases. We just had a large uh, Nature article come out where we where you put online an atlas of um, microarray at nine, different, nine different locations in the human brain and six brains, where we sequence and analyze um, the um, expression of uh, genes in the human brain. That's sort of our, our, our trademark. So what we want to do, so there are roughly two million neurons we're talking about, 10 to the 6 in the mouse visual cortex. We, what we want to do, we want to exhaust them, this, we want to exhaustively describe them, count them, record from them, interfere with them, you might have heard or you're probably familiar with techniques such as optogenetics where we can now interfere delicately, deliberately, transiently, reversibly, where we can turn particular neurons on or off with precision at the millisecond level. We can turn neurons on, we can induce spikes at the millisecond level, we can turn neurons off at the millisecond level. Also, we can turn the sets of molecular identified neurons. As long as we know their molecular zip code, we can turn neurons off anywhere in the brain. And we, I mean, those are really uh, fantastic techniques. Now, why is all of this difficult? Why hasn't this been done? Well, there are lots of neurons. As I mentioned, even a simple creature like C. elegans, there are 302, and they're very complicated. If you look at a mammal and mammalian brain, such as we're focusing on, it's difficult, even with the most advanced uh, technologies, to record for more than 0.01% of them. And in order to understand the brain, it's not just sufficient to do fMRI. Just like in order to understand chemistry, you don't need to know, just need to know about the bulk property of materials, but, but you need to know about valence electrodes and conduction band electrodes, right? We're all familiar with that as EE people. That's essential to understand chemistry. Likewise, to understand the brain, it's essential to know the, the nervous system at the cellular level. 
if you want, neurons are the atoms of perception and, and, and behavior and, and consciousness. So you need to record from individual. FMI and EG, MEG, they're all cool techniques, but they're very crude, right? They, because in a, for example, typical FMI voxel, you observe neurons, um, probably a million neurons of all different cell types, and what you track is actually their hemodynamic, their power consumption. We don't have a list of cellular components. As I told you, we only recently, the field has only recently realized that there are so many different cell types, and you can't just say, well, 20% of, of, uh, of neurons in one area do this. You need to know which, where, what, uh, what type of those neurons are. There are no accepted standard in the field. It's pretty shocking if you come from a field like electrical engineering physics. In neuroscience, there are very few relevant standards. So even if you go in something like 40 hertz, it's been studied since uh, probably 30 years now, every lab will have their own definition of uh, what 40 hertz mean. Even if you look at as, as something even more ele uh, elementary, what a spike, surely a spike is a spike is a spike. Well, that's just not true because it depends on your spike detection software. And there are dozens and dozens of different spike detection software, and everybody swears by their software, and there's no attempt to compare and contrast them because they all give different results. There are no central unifying projects in the field. The sociology of neuroscience is characterized by a, what I call a sociological Big Bang. There are roughly 10,000 labs um, heading off in all possible directions. How many of you have been uh, to meetings at the Society of Neuroscience? I told you, so you know this, right? There are 30,000 people and you get a headache, just walk, you know, you walk by a mile of posters. And the dominant thing is everybody has a different animal system they study, everybody has a different method, everybody has different analysis, everybody looks at different developmental time points, young, old, immature animals, mature animals, embryonic animals, aged animals. Um, and so, it's, so that's great. I mean, that's part of the academic endeavor and, and I love that. But, but in, if you, so that's great if you want to populate a certain, if you want to quickly understand something about um, um, all, sort of the range of possible phenomena, that's sort of great. But if you want to start saying, okay, that's cool now, now let's do something systematic where we really systematically want to exhaust and really describe things in great detail that enterprise doesn't lend itself. And partly it's because universities or other uh, institutions like the, like the um, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, etc., they're not set up for that because they're based on the, on the idea of orthogonalization, of competition, right? You have to be, whether you're a grad student getting your PhD or whether you're an author trying to get your nature or science paper or whether you're a professor trying to get tenure or whether you're a PI trying to get a uh, grant, you have to be as different from everybody else as possible because otherwise people will say, well, somebody's done something similar, this is boring can't do it. Um, so universities aren't really set up for that. And finally, that's been my great frustration, there's only limited interaction between experiment modeling and theory. And typically it involves a, gra a, a grant giving body who says, well, I'll only give you gra money if you theoreticians work together with you modelers. And then what you do is scramble once a year to synchronize your logos on your slides. Now, why do we study cortex? So, so we're trying to do things different, uh, differently. Uh, um, as I said, university, this type of research is absolutely necessary to discover a new phenomena, but we need a sort of a different organization if we want to uh, exploit things systematically. Why do we study on neocortex rather than on the retina or the cochlea or the, or the hypothalamus? The, the interesting thing about cortex, it's a, it's, a, it's a two plus epsilon dimensional computational tissue. That's the way I think about it. It's really a two, dim, two plus epsilon. What I mean by that is if you look at a cause, so a co neocortex is the, one of the hallmarks of mammals, right? Defines um, uh, the mammalian uh, phylum. Now, uh, um, what it is, if you look at, let's say, a hedgehog, or you look at a mouse, or you look at a dog, a cat, a seal, a dolphin, a monkey, a human, the width of this tissue changes by maybe factor two, maybe or factor three, from one millimeter in a mouse to two to three millimeter in a human. But the extent changes uh, by a factor of 100,000. All the elements, so if you take a little piece of column of this cortical tissue, to first order, they're very similar. So if I gave you a little piece of mouse, uh, you know, a little sugar, um, a tiny one by one by one millimeter piece of mouse, monkey, and human, nobody but a few experts can tell the difference. I mean, there are differences there, but, there, but overall, it's remarkable how similar the tissue is. It evolved something like 200 million years ago, you know, that's the last time we, um, or, 180 million years ago, common ancestor to all mammals, and it seemed to have been very flexible such that it rapidly expanded. So in, in our case, it expanded by a factor of three over the last five million years from the, from the chimpanzee. So it's relatively uniform, although there are also lots and lots of differences, and of course we have to understand both the uniformity and the differences. 
And, it's, and the question is, where do you begin? Do you first emphasize the uniformity, or do you first emphasize the difference in the answer is both? Um, so the question is, what's the core columnar operation performed by the solid tissue? Why do we study the mouse? Well, it has a cool thing. It has a smooth cortex, which means you can, using uh, optic, optical imaging, you can now image all the neurons in a particular area. And people are now beginning to make the brain transparent. Um, so you can really um, uh, image with proper techni uh, optical techniques now all the way down to the bottom of, um, of layer 5 and layer 6 of cortex. It's much more difficult in an animal like a monkey or like a human that, you know, where the, it's heavily indentated. So to give you a, a size, so the mouse brain is roughly one square centimeter in, in area. Its surface, air, its surface volume is on the order of half a sugar cube, on the order of half a cubic uh, centimeter. The human brain is a thousand times bigger. Its surface area is roughly a thousand. So think about you have a thousand, a thousand so it's like 12 inch uh, pizza. So think about you have two 12 inch pizzas in your head, but they're all sort of scrambled up and put here and here. Mouse, it's the same thing except it's, it's, um, it's smooth. The nice thing about it, it's sm so it's small enough that you can study it uh, reasonable, comprehensible. It has, I'll show you, it has standardizable cortex-dependent behaviors. And of course, the, uh, for biologists, the most interesting, its um, genetic code is worked out in great detail. And as I mentioned previously, we now have these techniques called optogenetics, where we can intervene at a given point where we can think, turn things on or off. That means we can move from correlation well, see, every time the mouse sees red, this part of the brain lights up. That's, of course, also what happened in fMRI, right? You know, you see something and that part of the brain lights up, or this part of the brain lights up when, you, when, you, uh, when you're listening to something. We can move to causation. We can now turn those neurons off, and we can see what, if any, is a specific deficit in behavior. You have a normal animal. It grows up perfectly normal. It does its thing. Now you knock up, you know, you knock uh, down or uh, out one particular set of neurons, and you see the direct, you can observe, if you do it properly, direct effects on behavior. That's very, very powerful. So that allows you to move from, from just correlating things to causation. And it can be used to study what I'm most interested in, which is selective visual attention and selective visual consciousness. <clears throat> Here are some comparisons. So I mentioned already, roughly a factor 1,000 difference. 86 billion neurons in humans, 71 million in a, in a mouse. In cortex, the stuff that we primarily focus on, I should say cortical thalamic system, we're doing both cortex and thalamus, it's on the order of 16 billion in humans and 14 million in, um, in a mouse. Um, visual cortex, I mean, there you have the numbers. There are roughly 1 million fibers coming up from each eye in us. There are roughly 20 times less, 44,000 uh, uh, coming up from the, from, the, um, from the mouse. So at this level, it's, it seems to be a similar architecture, not the same, just scaled down by a factor 1,000. In fact, the best way to think about the difference between human and mouse is not to look for magic differences. People always look for magic differences. Spindle cells, for instance. Well, they turn out many animals have sp spindle cells, like even hippopotamus. Uh, or they're looking for other magic difference that somehow makes it, must, you know, explain why I'm never going to have a dinner conversation with a mouse, right? Why is that? Well, I think the biggest, the single biggest reason is just that my brain is a thousand times bigger than the brain of a mouse. I think that's the single, single biggest difference. Not that there's something magically different in me uh, um, besides this huge um, size differences. There are two uh, cones, right? Most of us, except a few guys here, uh, have three cones. The, there's a shift in the UV, but that's all detailed. Um, the beautiful thing is here you can see the entire, you can observe the entire visual system. So in us, the visual system is fairly big. Primary visual cortex, which is the terminus of the, reti of the retina through the, through the uh, midway uh, relay in the thalamus, is roughly as big as a credit card, but folded. We have two of them. But then, of course, we have this ring of so-called extra stride areas, you know, that do high-level processing. So it's very large in us. Here in a mouse, you've got, all, you've got 10 visual areas. That's primary visual cortex. So that's where the input from the retina goes to the LGN, which is a part of the, of the thalamus. And then from there, it goes to primary visual cortex. And from there, it's distributed to sort of a, a, a belt of nine other extra, uh, um, um, higher order visual areas. And from there, it goes to lots of other places. <laughs> the nice thing is it's, it's small, one millimeter. So you can put one observation chamber over it and study the entire, um, you can study the entire visual system. <clears throat> we need to know the connectivity, so I'll, I, I thought I'd throw in an, an example of a pipeline, high throughput project we're doing. So as I mentioned, we really need to know the connectivity, right? How can you, if, you, if your car doesn't work anymore, 
and you bring it to a mechanic, you expect the, the mechanic to know all about the connection components inside the car. Now we don't know that for the brain and we need to. So what we're doing, so it's a four year long project using a couple of thousand mice, we, we, we're trying to use um, um, advanced uh, techniques to do uh, tracing at the cellular level where we inject specific regions, 300 different areas of the brain with very specific viruses. Some of those viruses will carry um, uh, will carry some um, molecular machinery to enable the virus only to be expressed in particular subtypes of neurons that have the right molecular address, that have the right molecular promoter, those are called key driver lines. And then we can visualize all of this um, in an entire brain, an entire mouse brain. So what took previously people, um, you know, years to do, you can now do, you can take a mouse, a living mouse, you, you inject um, um, a bunch, you know, a trillion or so um, virus particles in, in a particular part of the brain, those viruses will only infect a particular type of neuron for which they carry the promoter, then what that means, they, they infected, they, 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 uh, they, um, they co-expressed with a uh, so-called um, signaling molecule, a reporter, a GFP, a green, um, green fluorescent uh, protein, and that now that you can, the entire neuron lights up. If you bombard it with the right light, it'll fluoresce. And now you take it, so, and now no matter where it projects, it might start here and then go all the way down to the brainstem. You wait two or three weeks for this virus to express itself and the, the, this reporter to express itself. You sacrifice the animal, so now you have to take out its brains, a little sugar cube. You put it in an automatic uh, two-photon machine, of which we have a large number. You cut it, and 19 hours later, you have the 750 terabyte, um, gigabyte file where you have the complete image when you can reconstruct now using automatic computer vision techniques um, the, the projection associated with this particular type of, um, of, um, of, uh, of cell at a high resolution, so you get vertical XY 0.35 micrometer resolution. So you can do that throughout the brain, there's a lot of saturation here. Let's skip all of this. So here you can see it, for example, we're moving in a single mouse brain, we're moving from the front all the way to the back. And this is a movie, every slice is 100 micrometers, so tenth of a millimeter away from the next one. So it just cuts like this, this automatic tool. And you can see, so here, for example, you've got an injection on the right primary visual cortex. It injected there. It goes down to the thalamus, and then it goes to another cortical area. So you, now by doing this reconstruction in 3D, and you can download this data for free on our website, you can see, uh, you can visualize throughout the entire brain these connections. Here's an injection in the thalamus, which goes only to the, layer, to the top layer. So cortex is a layered structure. It only goes to layer one. It was injected there, where the very bright signal was. And then it goes in 3D. And the trouble with the brain is it's very difficult to visualize because it's a, it's a 3D structure. Right? It's a very complicated 3D structure. So you've got to become familiar with these things. Anyhow, so you can see in uh, all the different areas this, um, this, um, this projection goes. So you do that a couple of thousand times. And here you have it in different animals and all those sites you can see up there. <coughs> so this requires a large informatics pipeline. It requires a very a lot of process engineering to do this automatically, day in, day out, six brains a day, over you know six day, six days a week, over you know fifty uh, weeks a year, over many years, and then you get beautiful data like this. You get the detailed connectivity data for the for the, the detailed connectivity matrix for the entire mouse brain at the cellular level resolution, which is of course which is going to be essential to understand the brain. And then you can plot it in 3D, and you can download all of this, and you can get a viewer, and you can turn around in 3D to try to visualize it. So here's again this point I emphasized before, already felt tight. So this is a classical picture from Dick Maslin 10 years ago, roughly. So in the retina, people think, oh, retina is easy. Retina is just, it's just a camera, right? So all you need is a, is a couple of photoreceptors to acquire the RGB signal, and then sort of a signal, you know, and then you chop it up into spikes and send it out in this address event scheme onto the optic nerve. Well, it turns out this single job is actually done by 50 to 60 different cell types. They're pretty much the same in us or in a mouse or in, in most uh, mammals, in fact, in most vertebrates, with, with some specialization, but by and large very similar. So on the bottom you have the, the, out, so the top you have the cone photoreceptor, at the bottom you have the, you have the outputs, uh, the, the ganglion cells. Those are the only neurons actually that leave the, that leave the um, retina and whose spikes convey everything that we see. So the point I wanted to make here, so every neuron in the retina can be assigned to one of those 50 or 55, whatever cell types it is. So it's a little bit like the periodic table in chemistry, where every um, element can be unambiguously uh, identified or mapped onto one of the um, elements. We don't know whether this is true 
in general in biology, uh, for example, in cortex. Some people think it is true that every neuron can, uh, can ultimately be assigned to one type of neuron. Some people think, well, there might be broad trends, but it's going to be unclear whether there are very specific bins. It's also unclear how plastic are these bins. In the retina, we know in adult there's very little plasticity, or essentially no plasticity in the retina. In cortex, of course, cortex is very plastic, and so one question that we haven't, the field hasn't answered, to what extent are these bins uh, amenable to, to, to experience? We don't know. Um, yeah, so here, this is a complete map of all of, um, of, all of the mouse cortex. Um, it's much, much smaller than, as I said, a thousand times smaller. So the advantage is you can put a single observational chamber and then you can do optical imaging. Not only electrophysiological um, recording using uh, high density silicon probes, but you can, you can infect uh, cells, again, particular types of cells, with um, um, uh, a particular type of virus that expresses a particular type of, of, um, of protein that expresses calcium. And so essentially every time the neuron spikes, this little neuron will generate a flash of light, of green light, and you can observe that in special cameras. And what you see, this tells us, the experts, also receptor field, that the mouse, basically, mouse primary visual cortex is very similar to monkey visual cortex, not the same. Monkey has much higher vision, so the mouse sees roughly as well as we do at 50, you know, at 15 or 18 degrees eccentricity. It doesn't have high acuity. Its eye is roughly 10 times smaller than our eye. It doesn't have the same acuity, but it has perfect vision and has receptive field, just like, just like you expected. And, and we're going to map these. Uh, and we're mapping now with Clay Reed. We recruited him from, uh, he was a professor at Harvard, and joined us to do detailed imaging using standard stimuli, gratings, waves, Gabor patches, to try to understand in detail cortex. And to do, this is sort of an example, study where you can study those, those columns indicate the mean orientation selectivity, direction selectivity, spatial frequency, temporal frequency of, um, of seven visual areas. So the advantage of studying the mouse is that you can immediately get an overview of many, many visual areas, which is very difficult to do in a monkey and right now not really possible because we can't by and large record single neuron from the human brain. We're also developing very advanced silicon probe. This is together with iMac, the silicon foundry and design shop in, in Belgium where we're planning, this is done together with Howard Hughes Medical Institute, where we're planning high density of these probes using uh, titanium nitride, where we can record from up to 500 of them per shank and then multiplex them, so you only have a couple of, of, um, of wires going out. The aim here is to record from every single neuron in a column. You really want to be able to listen to every single neuron in order to properly understand, because only then you can begin, there's a hope of beginning to understand. That was a problem. Uh, with C. elegans. So C. elegans, we have the complete connectome. We have, have it since 1986. That 1986, a fantastic PhD work, very, very difficult, by Ed White, resulted in the complete EM uh, resectioning, essentially uh, without much computer help, of the complete connectome of, of two worms. It hasn't helped us construct a theory of it because we can't, only un until recently, it wasn't possible to record from them. This is much easier to do in a, in a mammal. Here's, for example, a, 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 a task that a mouse can do. This is done by Sean Olson, who's going to join us in a couple of months. This is done just to, for fun. So here, these are different people at the institute. And the mouse, you can train a mouse very quickly to recognize things visually. So, for example, it slows down when it sees, uh, sees pictures of me. <laughs> right? Then it slows down, because then it gets water. And so... I mean, so it's relatively easy. So now you can imagine, for example, you can see, does it get, uh, you know, if you show a different picture of me looking from the left to the right, or does it have the face inversion effect if you put the picture upside down? So if, once you have a behavior set up like this, you can now test a whole lot of clever visual behaviors to see how clever are these mice. And they've been around since, we have, well, 125 million years. They're very clever. Um, what this also shows, well, what this doesn't show, but additional experiments by, done by Sean Olson, you can use channel rhodopsin, these, one of these uh, fantastic tools, to inactivate briefly by shining light on cortex. You can turn your cortex off or on, and so you can infer causality. So, for example, you can show that this task could not, cannot be done by the mouse if you turn off primary visual cortex. Because you always got to worry, given the large, the high uh, um, redundancy in, in the brain, do you actually need cortex for that? Because also so-called decorticated animals can also do things like, like simple, I mean, you can take a cortex away in a cat and a cat is still capable 
of uh, reasonable sophisticated visual behavior. So you need constantly you need to probe the system, you know, for, for causation. But we have the tools that we can do this now. <laughs> Let's skip that. Finally, we want to model it at great detail. Oh yeah, so we we have big. Uh, this is our patron saint. I don't know if, who remembers him, the count, count van count. So because we want to do things every very quantitatively, and, you know, actually it's very difficult if you talk to neuroanatomists to get them to count things. They always say, well, there are many neurons or there are few projections, but we actually, of course, need to know how many neurons are there exactly. And there's no reason, there's no reason this cannot be done in a, in, a, in a mammal. Yes, there is more variability compared to C. elegans, and there is possibly more variability compared to uh, the fly, although that's not sure yet. But uh, that doesn't mean you, you can't, with high degree of standardization, count exactly how many neurons are there in different parts of the brain in different animals. Lastly, we, we'd like to model, as I explained. So there are two sorts of models. They're both cost grain. Well, there's a whole range of, of modeling. Um, uh, so I'm not here as, um, uh, talking about algorithmic modeling. Right? So for example, um, as, um, um, as Kurzweil or, or Jeff Hawkins proposed, in fact, 10 years earlier, using, for example, hidden Markov models to, to, to model the brain. That's sort of very um, algorithmic approach. Here I'm talking about actually trying to model sort of what you see in, um, or some aspect of what you see in your experiment. So one approach is, and we're doing both, is to construct models where you model every single neuron in the brain right now or in the next couple of years. But every model is, every neuron is very simple. For example, you model it using an integrated fire or an integrated fire neuron with a couple of channels added so you get, you know, spiking and bursting behavior. The advantage of this is you can replicate a lot of the receptive field study. You can link individual neurons. You can have different cell types. You can include different cell type connectivity rules of the sort that, as I mentioned, use essential. You can simulate, for example, uh, sleep and awake behavior. You can do all sorts of clever things. You can, for example, model the retina. So you can take any, you know, any move your picture show to the model. It converts it automatically into spikes. That, 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 that correspond to the output of, the, of your optic nerve and then feed it into this visual cortical model. And we're now designing uh, <clears throat> with Google a free open source web-based cost platform uh, co uh, collaboration environment we call Big Brain. because one problem is folks, so let's say you want to model a million units with a billion synapses. Today you can do that on a, on a Sandy Ridge uh, Intel with 64 gig or something. But of course, as everybody knows who's done this, you, you, there are many degrees of freedom, right? You have many, many parameters. And so the way to do this, you have to run 10,000 different parameter simulations. Well, if you go on, you know, big brain and, you know, uh, rent for a couple of hours, uh, 100,000 or a million CPUs, it's now possible, you know, then you can do these things in an hour rather than wait a million hours for doing it on one. So it's pretty cool. The drawback of, of course is those neurons are very simple and we know neurons have vast complexity. I've spent 20 years of my life studying single neurons. So the more uh, physical, biophysical correct way to model them would be to use excited, to actually model their detailed electrical behavior. Now we can do this and it's very encouraging to me because these high density models now allow us to really show that we're beginning to understand the, the physics, the biophysics of, excitable, of this excitable piece of tissue at a time scale, let's say, from 1 to 1,000 hertz, reasonable well. Because we can put all those compartments and stuff in there, like, for example, um, Henry Markham. In fact, this work was done together with Henry Markham and the Blue Brain team um, in, in, in my lab and, and his group. But uh, so, so, so we can really put everything, you can put in things that are really satisfactory to a physicist, like Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage laws, right? It's nice to actually conserve charge. Of course, leaky integrated fine neurons don't have charge to conserve, so... You don't have to be physical accurate. So this makes me feel much better. But they come at a big, big price. Conceptually, they come at a price because now you have this gigantic coupled PDE, right? It's very difficult to understand because it's heavily nonlinear, right? And it's not just a simple spiking nonlinearity like a simple threshold and integrated fire, but there are all these calcium and sodium spikes and, and NMDA spikes and all that sort of stuff. So it's very difficult to conceptually understand and to be able to abstract and to give to you, for example, from an engineering point of view, as, uh, as Lloyd Watts uh, demonstrated. For that, you rather want to stay with the, the simpler leaky integrated file model. And also, they're very, very expensive to simulate because now, you know, you may have a, a couple of thousand um, uh, PDEs just to simulate one neuron, and then you want to model many of them. The advantage is you can directly compare them uh, to the experiment. So this is what we did here a couple of years ago, where you can directly do 
very detailed comparison between experiment and model, whether you're modeling calcium in dynamics or whether you're modeling the electric field. So that's pretty cool. But there's a price to be paid, particular, not only you're going to spend a lot of time updating your CPU, but if you have large networks, you need to wait for the other guy to finish on the other CPU. If you're in a cloud, for instance, you need to wait for the other guy to finish before you can update your state, right? Because you're connected with the other guy with all these synapses, and I have to wait f to know whether the presynaptic neuron fired. So I have to wait on, ev on uh, everybody else. Very expensive. So Markham solution is, of course, to go on a special uh, supercomputer that has special high-speed communication network. And we can do that now. So here we model a column, 12,000 neurons, 5 million compartments. So you've got on the order of uh, 30 million or 60 million uh, PDEs that you can solve uh, on 4,000 CPUs. It takes time. It takes roughly one hour, on the order of one hour for one second of simulated time. Um, here the other big problem, uh, so there are two problems here. One is computation. So I think with these supercomputers and, and, um, and the ever, uh, ever increasing um, uh, Moore's law, we can solve that. The much more difficult problem is the degrees of freedom. You now have vast degrees of freedom, you know, on the order of tens of thousands of degrees of freedom. And for the most part, they're only very little constrained by, by experimental tools. And so that's a big problem. And then you can model very detailed things, things like the local field potential. You can actually compute now quite accurately the potential distribution, at least in very small volumes, of the brain. <coughs> all right, so to finish, so these are plans. So this is our promissory note. We started last year. We've now hired our first uh, 60 people. As I said, we want to hire a couple of hundred people more and build a building and build all these instruments. So it's a 10 year plus effort. They come uh, with a couple of unique challenges. Um, so A, we, we can't be and we don't want to be, and we, also we can't compete against you know, the world class university and neurobiology departments like at Stanford or Caltech or Harvard or, or uh, at other places. Um, Rather, what we want to do, we want to have many people just focus on one or two goals rather than having 20 PIs all heading off in, in, um, in different directions. So we, we want to build these state-of-the-art observer observatories. We want to do this very tight integration between modeling and theory and, and experiment. So we have a very tight virtuous loop between uh, experiment and model. And the problem we are facing is a problem that another community has faced already and apparently has solved successfully, namely the physics community where you now have collaboration that involves 500 people, 1,000 people, you know, if you see their publications. So somehow they've learned to harness the creativity and drive of, of the individual investigator, who of course make all the difference, um, by uh, well emphasizing the, the team aspect. So it's really partly an experiment in the uh, sociology of, of neuroscience. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. So, so the entire connectivity, so we, we using three te te we're planning on using three techniques. One is EM with labels. So we know, for example, we're labeling um, layer, layer five uh, cell and then do EM electromicroscopy. The other one is um, rabies viruses, what we're now doing, that you can go to a single neuron and inject a modified, you know, like Ed Carlowitz at Salk has pioneered this, where you go into one neuron, infected with the rabies virus, the same rabies virus that, you know, a mad animal will have. And then this, this virus, will tra that's what it does. It travels backwards only to the, to the presynaptic neuron. But you, 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 you pull a special trick, so it, only, it stops it. So it only infects all the presynaptic neuron. It also expresses a label. So now you can see this neuron is connected to all these other ones. Um, and then another technique using channel rhodopsin, where we're going to play it like the piano, where we record from one cell and put channel rhodopsin, let's say, in a particular type of, let's say, pavalmobin cell, and then with later stimulate each one and record from the cell and see does it, does it have a specific IPSPs. Yeah, because it has to be at the cell type specific level. It can't, it can't be uh, just any connectivity. We have to know which cell type. <clears throat> Gustav, um, your institute in some ways is very similar to Genelia Farm, and in some ways is radically different. 
and yet both of your approaches are radically different from what has been around for a lot of years uh, that we both know very well. I'm wondering if you could actually talk about uh, both of these as experiments in team neuroscience and how uh, we might expand from them uh, to have the field be more successful in the future. So, so I've talked with Jerry Rubin uh, about this. So, so Jerry Rubin, they're sort of between us and universities. The univer at the university, the approach is you take a PI, you give him or her money, and then you know, he or she with a postdoc and a student will do great science, and you have a bunch of individual projects. What, what Janelle is trying to do is to be a little bit more focused, and they are more focused. For example, they made a decision, no human work, no monkey work. Also, there are only going to be a few model organisms, like flies, worms, um, fish, uh, barn owls, uh, mouse, of course, but but within those, you still have a lot. You still have a bunch of PIs that can pretty much do what they want, and they do, and they do great research. So we are much more on the. Uh, if you put a university here and industry here, we are much more towards the industry where we have products, we announce products with deadlines. So we have advi external advisory committees. We announce, for example, we say this this connectivity. There's going to be phase one, two, and three at these dates. And then we have to do everything we can to meet those um, uh, those products. Our customer, we have we talk about customers. Those are our scientists. We don't make any money. We, in fact, we, we use a lot of money. But but so so in that sense, we are we we are, we are more sort of like an um, um, industry. And it remains to be seen to what extent this this model is um, is successful at, at at what it does. I think it should do certain things very very well. It's not going to do other things so well because it's not designed for that. But it requires somebody or a government or somebody who's willing to fund. And of course, PIs are resistant, right? Having been a PI, I know, because I don't want anybody to tell me what I want to do, right? I want to do whatever I want to do. And somebody offers me money, then I'll try to say, well, I want to do that, but I'm really going to continue to pursue my own interests. So, so, I mean, that's just the, the, the nature of, of humans. So here it's very different because we have these, we have these teams and, and we have constant meetings to, you know, stakeholder, line meeting, and program manager and all of that. You guys are probably very familiar with it, National Labs. <clears throat> I wonder what is really the measure of success for your project? Or more specifically, would you say that at the end, the agreement of experimental data with simulation, is, is that what you want to achieve as a success? It's a good question. So there, there, there are a few. So one is we want to get the complete taxonomy of all cell types. So just a whole, so, so there'll be a, f a bunch of database that's accessible to anybody, and of course we, we work with you know Henry and with you guys to make it accessible, particular to you. So to have all the cell types map completely, so we know they are whatever 95 cell types, and they cover 99% of all cells. We want to get the complete connectome, so we know within this position, within you know within certain parameter range, these are the all the type of connections that we observe in the cortical salamic system. So we want to do a few things exhaustively. And then we'd like to get characterize every cell type uh, using electrophysiological criteria, using transcriptomics, you know, where we suck out the individual mRNA and and doing uh, and, and the connectivity and the morphology again to get a big, you know, alphabet taxonomy of all the cell types. And then lastly, yes, what we would like to do within some metrics, so there have to be measures. Here's an experiment, and here's our model, and we can predict things. And the model and the experiment have lots and lots and lots of similarity. Because, I mean, your measurement could be wrong. It could be that you make errors in your measurement. How will you find that out? How, how, how do you know that you didn't measure the correct thing? I guess at the end you need some kind of, of comparison which you perform. Well, no, we, we, can do, we can do certain things without uh, modeling. So it's going to be a purely empirical question. Are there cell types? Are there unique cell types? How plastic are there? How many are there? And show them all to me you know, a complete taxonomy. That's going to be primarily an empirical question. And so that, if you focus enough resources on, with enough discipline, that I think there's no question you can do that. Just like the, uh, our, you know, human brain atlas, a mouse atlas, you just look at every gene in the, in the 22,000 genome and you map it using whatever technology you have. And then it's, it's what Sidney Brennan calls CAP, uh, complete accurate permanent, at that level of, of resolution. Of course, there's always a better technique that has a better resolution. So it, 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 the, the, but your question pertains really to the model. And of course, the model, as you know, you have to make myriad of decisions, what you're going to model, what's the resolution, at what time scale. And so that remains to be seen. Um, even defining a, a goal post is going to be, it's not easy, right? Because of course, we all know there's simulation and there's simulations. How widely applicable are they? Can you take this model from V1 and apply it to A1 
and can you take it from V1 in a mouse and apply it to V1 in a, in a human? Because we're also doing quite a bit of work using different, um, in situ uh, using different te technologies in the human brain to try to see to what extent can we go from mouse to human brain using stem cells. Yeah, so um, a couple times in your, in your talk, Tom, you mentioned the term, uh, a couple times in your presentation, you, uh, you mentioned the term canonical circuits. Uh, so presumably there, there are canonical computations that go along with those canonical circuits. And um, I, I take it from your, your introductory remarks, uh, you're, you're not a fan of this, this idea that there is a single canonical circuit. But do you have a bias in terms of like, you know, how big you think this library of canonical computations is? Yeah, so it's, it's, this is an ongoing discussion throughout the last 150 years of neuroscience between, you know, people who think it's all pretty much the same and then people who say, you know, V1 is radical different from A1, is radical different from prefrontal cortex. You know, ultimately, there are going to be algorithms that you can probably all implement in a, in a, in a, in a GPU or plus a lot of memory. There are going to be convolution algorithms, finite state machine algorithms. It's going to be, it, we know already in cortex, cortex is all about context, um, uh, sensitivity, right? So if you want a very naive characterization, many subcortical things like the, stri like the striatum, they probably do things more in um, um, hardwired after you learn them, while cortex is su supremely context dependent, right? So I can, you know, we all know uh, from our own decision. So the, the architecture of the cortex has to, uh, has to reflect that. So for instance, Rodney Douglas and Kevin Martin talk about a smart amplification as a canonical step. And this, uh, when a weak input from the periphery becomes amplified by local computation, so this amplification has to be extremely context dependent, dependent on other things nearby, on things in the past, uh, on, and on top-down um, top uh, control. So it can probably be implemented with a bunch of, uh, ultimately, with a bunch of uh, finite state machines, but that's just my current bias. I don't think, for example, there's any things like quantum computation going on. I don't think there's anything that requires, you know, a particular type of fancy hardware that we don't have. The question is, you know, it's, it's all about efficiency uh, and, and, and power requirement. And we don't really know yet where we, our bias is, rightly or wrongly, that spikes is really where all the action is, for instance, for consciousness, also for conscious perception. But that's a bias. And of course, some animals don't have spikes, like C. elegans. And you can see in synapses and spines already tremendous complexity. So it may well be that there is, as some people have surmised, much more complexity inside individual neurons and that you can't sweep that under the carpet. And it's going to be essential to get the efficiency of the brain to model that. It's really a bias right now, and, and we don't know which way it'll go. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I really meant what I said. We are at the, at the end of the beginning of understanding, uh, of beginning to understand the brain. It's, it's still very early day. Our science is 130 years old. So, um, vision is, of course, not the most important sense of a mouse. Um, on the other hand, vision is a beautiful system that, unlike hippocampus, is clearly connected to the outside yes. world in a defined way. Um, Still, lots of us like the hippocampus. So I'm wondering if you can talk to the choice of the visual. You have to start somewhere. So we thought a lot. Giri Bizaki is on our advisory board. Uh, you know, you have to start somewhere. Probably, I mean, uh, when I came, you know, I mean, I started this project, so this vision, because I'm a, I'm, I'm a visual scientist, the advantage of vision is we have pretty well-developed theories of vision. We can, uh, we can really precisely manipulate vision and visual display in, with high degree of spatial, temporal, chromatic accuracy. Of course, as you just mentioned, Jim, we don't, I mean, getting into the hippocampus is, um, is, is more complicated. But you, know, you could also mount a reasonable defense of doing this in hippocampus, but we choose to do it somewhere. You have to start, you know, even if you have a billion bucks, doing, you know, you say, you know, with all those people, you still have to, you still really have to relentless have to focus, focus, focus. So d even doing two very different things is going to dilute your effort. So, uh, kind of a technical neuroscience question. Uh, uh, our experience with optical techniques, whether calcium or, or intrinsic light scattering kinds of uh, imaging, was that uh, those were relatively slow signals relative to spike time. And uh, and our experience with multi-electrode arrays is that, you know, as a practical case, if you want to have chronic recording, you're, you're probably limited to a few hundred to a few thousand uh, electrodes. So, so there's really nothing 
uh, that's obvious that uh, that gets you to the whole brain scale that gives you the full temporal resolution that you want. Uh, do you have any uh, any ideas or thoughts about how to how to get around that barrier? No. So so things are constantly getting better, right? So now optical imaging you can do 100 hertz, and the signal to noise with the new GCam six that are now available is extremely good. Uh, no, but that's why you you know you know last Monday in fact New York Times published this. Uh, article prematurely on the brain activity map. So this brain activity map, if sequestration and all of that can be solved with, is supposed to put a lot of funding into the hands of PIs to develop technology such as the one you, you mentioned. You know, there are all sorts of ideas, nano diamonds and, and you know, tiny probes injected. Who knows? But there, yeah, there is no one single technique that does it all. It's entirely correct. Right now you need spikes to get the submilli precision and you want optics because it gives you the whole brain coverage and you get genetically uh, identifiable signals. So I think you need to do both games and then constantly evaluate and also develop other technologies and then see, you know, every two years make an evaluation of a new technology. There is no magic uh, prescription. All right. Thank you very much.